Hi everyone, this is Jennifer Bellavo, Director of Sales from Applied Math Modeling and today's moderator. Thank you for joining us online today. We're excited to share with you another great case study using Coulson software, modeling a non-raised floor dusted supply data center using Coulson. With me today is Paul Bemis and Liz Marshall, Applied Math Modeling's President and CEO and Director of Technical Services, as well as Dana Etherington. Dana is an energy engineer with CRV Consulting Engineers in Cambridge, Massachusetts, specializing in the optimization of high-tech facilities and systems, which includes pharma, biotech, labs, and data centers. Dana has several years of experience in system optimization coupled with computational fluid dynamics. He's a certified engineer, energy manager and lead accredited professional and is currently pursuing a master's degree in, engineer, in energy engineering at UMass Lowell. So before we get started, I'd like to inform everyone that we will have a question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. You can enter your questions in the question panel that's located on the right-hand side of your screen throughout the presentation. You'll have to wait till the end. If you're having technical difficulties, please click on the raise hand icon, and I'll respond to you through the chat window. So be looking in the chat window if you've got a question. I'll respond to you through there. All right. Without further delay, let's get started. Paul? Thanks, Jan, and welcome, everyone, to the uh, event today. We have a, an interesting design here to take a look at today, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here with Dana. Welcome, Dana, to the show. Thank you, Paul. And welcome, Liz, to our Thank show you. again this month. It, uh, it's you, always Paul. fun to take a look at these different designs and, uh, and see where they take us. Mm -hmm. Now, before uh, we get started, let me give you a little outline. For those of us in the for those of you in the audience, we're going to first review some common terms. I like to do a set of definitions first to set everybody's understanding of what we're talking about to be the same, so that if we use three-letter acronyms, at least we've defined them first. And then we're going to take a look at the design that we're looking at, and uh, Danny's going to talk a little about some of the constraints, uh, the design constraints uh, put on him by the uh, customer. We're going to do some initial analysis, and then we're going to refine that analysis until it meets our, our customers' needs. So let me start off with some definitions that most of you probably know by now, because I do review them each time, but uh, just to set the playing field in terms of understanding to be level, let me talk about uh, a few of these. PUE is the first one, and here, Liz, I've defined PUE as cooling energy plus IT energy over IT energy. Mm -hmm. Now. Not quite right, because um, there is more in the numerator usually when you define PUE than cooling energy. Mm -hmm. But the reason I use cooling energy up here is because it's the dominant factor in the calculation. That if you look at where the energy in the data center is being consumed, it's mm -hmm. cooling energy. Mm -hmm. So I use cooling energy plus IT energy divided by IT energy. That's, that's a fairly good representation of PUE. And uh, there are other factors. But because our presentation here is concerned primarily with cooling energy, I uh, use that as the primary indicator for determining PUE. Okay, now the other one we use is return temperature index, RTI. And RTI is defined as the rack flow rate divided by the air handler flow rate times 100. Now, you want 100% uh, here. It's just simply important with RTI to remember that what you're striving for is 100%. You want the rack flow rate to be equal to the air handler flow rate. Uh, now, if we have too much air handler flow rate, this number is going to drop down. That's usually the case. So you see here that if it is less than 100%, we have what we call net bypass airflow, which means the racks don't need all the air that's being put into the room and as a result that air generally goes right back to the air handler or the crack unit however you want to refer to it and when that happens of course you waste energy so a perfect system would be a hundred percent if on the other hand it's greater than a hundred percent it means the racks need more than is actually being supplied by the room and you're starving the racks and you're going to get recirculation around the rack so this is one of the key energy metrics. This was originally developed by uh, a company called ANSYS out of uh, San Francisco. Uh, if any of you have been through the DCEP training, uh, Magnus Erlin, who has often been with us on shows, 
before often talks about this parameter as being a key parameter. The other one is rack cooling index. And here what we're looking for is the temperature of the racks. And in particular, we're looking for a compliance with the ASHRAE standard here as set, in this case, for 64 to 80. This ASHRAE specification has moved a little recently, and these numbers have gone up. But generally, people like still to be in this range. They like their rack inlets to be greater than 64 and less than 80.6 in that range. And what this is a measure of, there's two parameters, RCI high and low. And if RCI high is 100%, it means that you have no samples. Of all the samples of data that you've taken in the room off rack inlets, you have no samples that exceed the max allowable range for temperature in the room. Uh, same case with under temp that if you have 100%, it means that you don't have any racks that are too cold. So this is kind of the Goldilocks test. You don't want your rack inlets to be too hot. You don't want your rack inlets to be too cold. You want them to be within a range. Now, electronics don't really degrade precipitously when you run them too cold, uh, but you waste a lot of energy when you run things too cold. So from an energy point of view, you want to be within specification and uh, not outside it. So we'll be looking at the RCI high and low for this design today as well. It's interesting. Very, you know, oftentimes we see data centers where one of them is uh, hundred percent, but the other one is way below. Uh, meaning that, you know, it's it's hundred percent on the high side because it's you know everything is is underneath that maximum value, but it's way under hundred percent on the low side. Meaning that there are a lot of there's you know a lot of equipment that is uh, either way too cold or there's a lot that's just a little too cold. It kind of combines both of those effects. This this parameter here combines both of the effects. That's correct. Not only the number of servers that are that are cold or hot, but how how cold and how hot. That's correct. That's correct. What we see a lot, Liz, I think, is RTI is is too low, which means there's too much air in the room, and mm -hmm. and and the RCI low. Is, yeah, is also is low. Uh, too low. There, you know, there's too many of those as well. So mm -hmm. uh, they're often too much air and too cold. And it's often because they've been designed for some maximum condition that hasn't yet been achieved, and they're running under their design center is often what we right. see. Yeah. OK. So now the techniques for improving the efficiency of data center cooling systems is always to maximize the temperature difference across all the heat exchangers. So what we're trying to do is get the return hot air as hot as we possibly can get it back to the crack unit. And you can do that by, of course, managing your airflow. You can also reduce your total crack airflow. Remember that heat transfer is mass flow rate times specific heat times delta T. So if you can get the mass flow rate down, then the delta T is going to be higher. So again, this issue of how much air and how fast is the air moving across the heat exchangers is key to getting the temperature and the efficiency uh, correct in a data center. The other component is cold air supply temperature. And we've gone over this a number of times in earlier webinars where we talk about the mechanical shaft power work required to get cold air. Uh, cold air uh, takes energy. And so the higher the temperature of the cold air, the higher the supply air temperature, uh, the more efficient the system will be. And it also opens the window for economizers to work over a broader range in terms of number of days of uh, potential use per year. So those are the two key things we're going to be looking for. So here, uh, Dana, let me, let me just turn it over to you here and talk a little bit about this design. This was a design your company is working on. I don't, I don't think it's directly in your geography. It's in one of your other geographies, correct? That's right. This was uh, a data center that I offered some CFD modeling for out of our Pennsylvania office. Mm -hmm. So basically they have non-raised floor, overhead ducted supply, uh, 6,000 square feet, um, 5,000 white space, 400 kW of IT load mm -hmm. um, through 88 server racks. Mm -hmm. So and, that, yeah, go ahead. N plus one design here, so you've, you've yep. got that as a constraint. That's right. So. We have six uh, upflow crack, crack units, yep. five of which will be operating at any one time mm -hmm. for redundancy. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, 
ducted overhead supply, non-raised floor. It, was it a design uh, decision, or how did you arrive at, uh, at this? Because an alternative would have been a raised floor approach. Yeah, we actually decided to go with ducted overhead supply because we have fairly high densities yes. um, on the servers. Yes. So we figured ducting it overhead and dropping it down would be more efficient with the higher density. Yes, it certainly uh, is a choice that a lot of people are making these days, dumping the cold air straight down from the top. Uh, this, this, of course, cold air is more dense, so it, it falls um, a little better as opposed to pushing it up. And uh, we see, we're seeing quite a bit of this, Liz, aren't we, in terms of design? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Particularly for high density. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what I've done here is I've created a, a small animation here to show you what this data center looks like. And maybe you can just talk us through this, uh, this design as, as I show this. Uh, and I don't know how well this will come through for those of you with different bandwidths, but uh, go ahead, Dana, and give us a, a, a talk on, on the design. All right, well, as you can see, so the walls are actually transparent. Yeah. So the, the crack units are sitting on the other side of the walls. Right. And yeah, I've, I've set the transparency there so we could see through it. Yep. Yep. So they're supplying air up into a common supply plenum, mm -hmm. and then that air is coming across these branch ductworks that you can, ductwork that you can see in green. Right, right across the top. And coming down. And dropping down. Yep. And that's dropping air down right. into a fully contained cold aisle. Yep. There you can see there's four of those. Yes. Um, and now so you've, is, you've uh, uh, put blocks here as well. I've got the blocks transparent as well, but you've yeah. blocked all the way out to the end, and you've put caps on the end. So you're fully contained here, aren't you? That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I actually use blocks to represent any of the racks that were not going to be filled yes. at this time. Yes. And I'd like to point out, this is a good modeling technique, Liz, right? We always recommend using blocks if you're not going to have a heat load, because yes. running with very yes. low heat loads yeah. is just tough on a solver, right? It is, yeah, because you have one, one with very low values next to one with very high values, and it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's tricky to get good accuracy, but mm -hmm. it can be done. But it's not much better to, instead of putting one watt in a, in a, in a rack, to just make it a block. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I've made a run of this here. This is a simulation, and um, Dana, you've already made a bunch of these runs, so I did this in version 4. I read it in and, and did it in version 4 so we could show off some of the new metrics in, in, in CoolSim 4. You notice here that I have this crack shut off. I think you called that number five. And uh, That's right. based on your crack failure analysis, that was the worst case scenario if that one was uh, off. So I've run these simulations with that one off so that we could have a look. But here is the design again, uh, same as before. Uh, this is Now I'm looking at the post-processing view. And uh, let's take a look at a couple things here. Uh, first of all, I'll show the summary report. And this is a standard output that comes from... Uh, from, from CoolSim 4 now. And you notice highest temperature in the data center is 87 degrees. So we're, we're a little bit warm in the data center. We assumed a coefficient of performance of 3. Now, in, in CoolSim 4, you have a couple choices. You can either use measurements that you've made on power and, and input the measurements into the system. Uh, or if you haven't built it yet, as we haven't in this case, you have to make some assumptions about what the efficiency is. We assume the coefficient performance here of three, which I think is a fairly good number. It's a fair number. It's what you know the, the, they recommend in the DCEP course that we took. It mm -hmm. tends to make the, the PUE one four three. I did break out the fan power itself uh, mm -hmm. so that that is unique. You see here an RTI of eighty eight, so we're blowing a little more air than we need here. RTI of a hundred, but here we go, Liz. This is what we always see, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the combination of the yeah. RCI low of of fifty. Okay, relative to the hot side, but That's not right. so much relative to the cold side. Yep. And now we've done a calculation on annual power required to drive the data center here. There are some assumptions here, and the assumptions include the COP of three and so forth. But I think more than anything, it's not so important on a on a brand new design to pin this annual cost exactly. Uh, but more to look at it as a percentage savings and do your variations and then look at, at percent improvement. Mm -hmm. So here's the crack performance report. We're running the supplies at 60 degrees, which is uh, uh, pretty cold, pretty darn cold. And uh, instead of going through all of these rack cooling reports, let's just jump over and take, take a look at the, uh, at the rack inlets themselves. So 
So to here, Dana, we've got quite a bit of variation of rack inlet temp across the room, right? What we're seeing, 8 degrees, I guess. No, that's a 60 down there. So we're seeing 16 degrees of variation from one side to the other. And if we look at it from the point of view of our new uh, scale here, we've added a couple of plots in V4. And this one is, does it comply to the ASHRAE recommended range of inlet? And you see here, it should be green everywhere. We're running awfully cold on the center of the room over here. So you've got some disparity here. Now, I suspect your loading's a lot higher over here, right? That's right. We have a lot of higher density equipment in that, that end of the room. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. And you had said, too, Dana, that it really didn't matter which of the cracks was disabled because all of the cooling air mixes together in that main ductwork, that main supply plenum, that um, it doesn't matter really whether you've got one of the cracks turned off on one side of the room or the other side of the room. You still see basically the same effect. That's right. You see mm -hmm. fairly similar results depending, you know, it doesn't matter which one's turned off. Right. But they do vary slightly just yeah. based on where it's pulling the return mm -hmm. air from. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing going on here is that there was a design constraint, I believe, that a customer didn't want the environment to be, or the, the human, quote, human environment to be greater than 80 degrees. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah, their, their thoughts on that was, well, we're going to have people working in this space and walking around, and we don't want them to be uncomfortable. Right. So they, they set a limit uh, at 80 degrees yes. across the data center. So here I've taken a, a cut at, at 6 feet, and you see here that our temperature in this room, although we're supplying at 60 degrees, uh, the, the environment itself where you'd be walking is running up to 86 degrees. And this is a classical example of a cold aisle contained situation. Cold aisle contained is great from a thermodynamics point of view. You're going to get the cold air directly on top of the servers, uh, and you get uniform distribution uh, across those servers in terms of rack inlet temp. But if you don't do anything with the, with the hot, you run into a situation where the humans in the room, when they're there, are actually walking around in the hot aisle. And uh, this causes uh, people to be uncomfortable. Often what will happen is the customer or the user or whoever, data center manager, will get nervous about this and start driving down <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the temperature. And when they drive down the, quote, sensed temperature in the room, they're driving down the hot, which forces the cold to be even colder, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case, if we drove the, uh, the temperature in, the, in, the, in this environment that we're seeing at 86 down to, say, 70, we'd have to drive the supply temps down to probably 50, which, again, mm -hmm. is a train wreck from the point of view of, of uh, of thermal efficiency. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that's kind of where you started. Now, um, let me just show you a couple of animations here. This is a cut, cut planes coming up through, and you can see the temperatures there in the, in the room. Although it's nice and cold, the servers are happy. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the environment where you would go to service them and so forth is, uh, is a problem. So I think they hear that we had problems with temperatures exceeding a certain level and uh, quite a bit of variance across. So a couple of nice things about what you did here, though, Dana. You did this in stages. One of the first things you did is to get a feel for what's going on in the room. And now here in this design, you've taken it a step further. You want to just walk us through this next stage? Yeah, so when I model, I like to start simple and build up on top of that. Uh, once I get a feel for what's going on and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, so here, I actually added in more detail on the branch ductwork. Yes. Based on actual design. Yes. So here we're stepping down. You can see the step there, um, yeah. and you're doing that to get the uh, the velocity of the air to be more uniform across those inlets, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, still, uh, still have the, uh, the the basic cold air contained, cold aisle contained, yeah. uh, hot air coming back. Now, over here, you've put a block. Uh, tell us a little bit about this room over here or this space and how it changed with time. Yeah, this, this space right here, the client was planning on putting um, server equipment in there, but they didn't want it to be part of the data center, per se. They didn't want it on the, the crack units. Mm -hmm. So at first, 
I modeled it, I blocked it out um, just to the bottom of the plenum. Mm -hmm. And after the first iteration, first couple iterations, they said, well, what if we just bring the wall all the way up, all the way up through the plenum up to the deck? Mm -hmm. So that's what I did here mm -hmm. with the block. I just blocked it out all the way up through the plenum. Yes. Now, the nice thing about using blocks and models is that it won't mesh over there, and so you, mm -hmm. the solution time goes up, right, Liz? We, mm -hmm. yep, we encourage people to goes use down. <laughs> the solution time goes down, yes. That's correct. Fewer yep. cells, right? That's correct. Because uh, what you'd like here is, um, you know, the fewer cells, the more, the faster it runs and, and the, mm -hmm. the quicker it converges, the better it behaves. Uh, and here you don't need, now there's two ways you could model this. You could put a wall here across using baffles and let the baffles have some leakage. But then we'd be meshing inside this space. And in this particular run, we're not interested in the, any of the details inside there in terms of solution. So he is use of blocks is a very nice way to go saves an awful lot of solve time, and convergence is faster, and uh, we, we, we recommend that. But mm -hmm. still having trouble with, with hot here, right, Dana? I mean, you're still, you're still too hot in these aisles. Let's take a look at your uh, rack inlet temperatures and see. Um, yes, things have improved. Now you've only got a six degree mm -hmm. variation. Mm -hmm. So that's much better than before. So the work you did on the ducts improved things quite a bit. Let's see if it conforms to our recommended range uh, we're too cold uh, still, so we've got problems with that, but at least the uniformity is better, right? And if we looked at the allowable range, yeah, it, it falls within the allowable range here, mm -hmm. uh, but not the recommended range. So making progress, but still not mm -hmm. quite there, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go for uh, the next step. Um, you ducted the hot air. You grabbed the hot air and pulled it out in your next design, right? Yeah, that's right. We decided to take that hot aisle and, and throw it directly up into the bottom. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is you decided to use VFD, so you're going to pull your, your total air supply down. And uh, now that you've controlled your, your uh, cold air a little better, uh, you're feeling more confident about a, your ability to pull the uh, total air supply down, get your RTI to effectively go up, and then begin increasing supply air temperature to improve your efficiency. So the reason we picked this one, and what we like about this, right, Liz, is that his, his progression was very nice. Mm -hmm. we, we teach this, don't we? Start off mm -hmm. with something, get your hands around the problem, yeah, exactly. get your something hands around the, yep. the flow of the room, and then progressively uh, add the detail. Um, yeah, make sure you understand what the simple model is really telling you. you know, that, that often guides the changes that you make. That's correct guides what modifications or what additional detail you think might be important because it's there's probably a lot to choose from in any given case. Right. It's important to understand the physics, isn't it, Liz? As a is, yeah. former physics teacher, you know that it's important to, to and, and by yeah. the way, physics can be understood at a relatively uh, you know, basic level. You don't have oh, to yes. have all the detail in it to understand right. the That's physics. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's true. And the big parameters are dominating mm -hmm. it anyway. So if you capture the big parameters, the total airflow, the position, the size of the, the loads, where the loads are, uh, you, can, you can learn an awful lot. Mm -hmm. But this is always the sequence that we go through. Improve the air management in the room. That will drive the RTI to be closer to 100%. VFDs are a great way to do that. And then once you've got your, your arms around the airflow in the room and can control it better, Start going for supply air temperature and see how high you can rise, how, how high you can increase it before you begin to, to run up against the specifications again. So here I made another small animation of uh, the, uh, the final design data. Maybe you can just walk us through this one. Uh, here you've done the hot aisle contain here and as well you've added that room in, correct? Yeah, that's right. So Later on in the design, of course, they change things uh, like this. You know, this often happens. Um, so they actually wanted to include the room with the rest of the data center and cool those servers um, off of crackiness. So what I did was I increased uh, that branch duct based on the actual design documents and brought it over and, and dumped some air to, the, to those um, servers. 
So now also, here, you didn't, uh, yeah. you, you're not cold aisle supplying them with, with ducks. You're just dropping the air straight down on them and, uh, and right. just letting them, mm -hmm. letting them breathe, I suppose, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so what we did with, with the rest of the servers, as you can see, we decided to duct the return air directly up into the plenum. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, the beauty of this design is you're dropping cold air into the room, uh, you're pulling the hot air out, and effectively now the, the user who walks in there, the facilitator, operator, whatever, maintenance person, is going to effectively be walking around inside the cold supply uh, air. Uh, the beauty of this is, you know, you bring your cold air supply up to, say, the specification is 80 degrees. Let's assume you could drive your cold air supply up to the minimum specification uh, or the maximum specification set by your server and be okay. Uh, it would still feel okay in the room. It would feel a little warm, but it would feel okay, and uh, you'd be maximizing your energy. I'll also point out too, Paul, that we removed the full containment on the cold aisles as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you effectively here, Dana, switched it from pure cold aisle containment to pure hot aisle containment. That's right. And now the difference here is that the user, uh, then they go in, the facility operator, maintenance person, whatever, is going to walk around in the cold aisle. And the goal here, therefore, is drive supply temp as high as you can. doesn't bother the, uh, the operator. Now, you've done some more work here on ducting as well. You got more intricate about how you did your, your supply ducts here as well, right? Yeah, based on the the design, we actually added a little bit more detail into the, the ductwork. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show that here. Yep. And you brought it down and you went around this corner and dropped right straight down onto the, onto those, yep. uh, uh, and again, this is in the post-processor. So let's take a look now at the, uh, the full range of temperature. Here we're looking at 72 to 80, so we've constrained it to uh, just 8 degrees of variation, despite the load. The load is most heavy over here on this end of the room, and that's nice and nice and cold, 72 mm -hmm. degrees. Uh, here you've also driven, let's just go to the summary report and take a look at the temperatures. You've driven up your supply temp to 72 degrees here, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So you moved up 12 degrees on your uh, supply temp because you got confident about that now that you've controlled your, your cold air. You also brought your total uh, supply down to 12,464. So it looks like what you're trying to do here is exactly match what your racks need. With the yeah, VFDs. so that, yeah, with the VFDs, we know that the crack units, the fans are going to be matching the demand yep. from the racks. So I just turned them down to match. So now if we go back to our energy report here, the COP went to 369. Now the reason it went to 369, I'll show you in a subsequent slide, how I did it, but I did this calculation, Dana, and all I did is assume that that you get, you know, about 2% uh, efficiency improvement out of the mechanical pump, you know, the heat pump, uh, when you in increase uh, cold air supply temperature by one degree. You get about 2% per degree F. That drives well, your CPU up. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Well, one thing I was going to mention is just that in terms of the way in which he piped the hot air up into the plenum, into the ceiling, he used um, one technique, which is to, you know, keep the flow going front to back through the racks, you know, maybe with uh, perforated doors on the backs of the racks, and then he enclosed the exhaust area at the back of the racks. And, you know, there are plenty of other ways of doing that using cabinets that are sealed in the back with chimneys on the top. So there are a lot of different ways of getting that hot air out of the room. Um, and he's just chosen a uh, you know, one way that actually allows them to group together a bunch of cabinets that are sitting together. It's a nice, nice way of, of getting the hot air out of there. But That's there right. A couple of op options there. Now, the other thing going on here is that the RTI is now almost 100%, Liz. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of right. nice. Mm -hmm. So he's got yes. the, the RTI at 100%. He's got the RCI high at 100%. He's got the RCI low at 100%. So these, these three parameters, ideal conditions. these are ideal, ideal conditions, yes. Uh, he's got all three of them running at 100%, which means I'm, I'm just right. I'm not over temp. I'm not under temp. My RTI is perfect, and that's a very nice, and you see here the, uh, the COP has gone up. The PUE has come down. I mean, lower is better for that. Uh, so uh, really very nice, 
from a, from a design point of view, these parameters are very nicely optimized. Now, just going back for a moment to the uh, design, what you were talking about here, Liz, is that he has in, encapsulated the, the rears of these cabinets right, right here, right? Right, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's done each one of them independently here. Now, you could, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, build those out as uh, probably one there, but he's done a nice mm -hmm. job in cups. Mm -hmm. And your point is these run straight front to back, which is a nice design. If we look at it from the top, you can see here as the air comes down, through these uh, supplied ducts, uh, the rack pulls it through with its own fans and then dumps it into a cabinet behind, effectively a space behind. Um, probably what you like about this is that it reduces the impedance, doesn't it, on the flow right yeah. there? Yeah, it's a nice wide open space, yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. So now our racks are in conformance. Here you see the racks are within specification on recommended. They're obviously going to be within on allowable. And the nice thing here about the space itself is that the space now is going to be 72 degrees uh, as the person walks around inside it. So the cold aisle is 72 degrees, which is a nice temperature, and he's within six or seven degrees on rack inlet everywhere. And if we look at his variation, so that's a that's a that's a very nice design. So we like that, Dana. Nice work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the energy calculations here that, uh, that I did uh, associated with this, that uh, we have 400 kW of heat load, a little bit of heat transfer through the walls, so we have a total heat load of about 390. The, uh, the crack power, about 130 here, based on a COP of 3. Uh, fan power, 37. Uh, that came from the fact that these are about 10 horsepower apiece, the fans, and there's five of them. And total cooling power, therefore, is 167, which is just the sum of these two, COP of 3. It brings the total facility power to five, just about 560, PUE of 143, and a cost of electricity, assuming 10 cents, we end up with an initial number. This was the first number of about 489. Now, if we drive the supplier up to 72%, we improve the COP by about 23%. These, this is a rule of thumb, but I find this to be pretty consistent uh, throughout a variety of texts and a variety of references. This is an ASHRAE references this in their data center design handbook, and I see this referenced uh, quite a few places, about 2% 2, 2 per degree F. And of course, you have the fans when you, draw, when you use a VFD, um, and you reduce the RPM of the fan, and therefore you reduce the flow rate and, of course, the power. And this is ideally, Liz, a cubic function, right? But mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. I assume just a power of 2.5 because they're mm -hmm. not perfect. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the fan power drops down to 29 uh, from, I think it was 37 before. The crack uh, power drops down as well. COP improves to 369. PUE drops to 135, and we get a total power annual cost of, of 461. Mm -hmm. So if we put those side by side, and this is all I did here, Liz, is drag the summary reports into Excel, put them mm -hmm. side by side, and cut and paste mm -hmm. them into PowerPoint. One of the nice mm -hmm. things about yeah. Ulsim um, will yeah, continue yeah. to stress is you can do this kind of thing very easily. Mm -hmm. And you see here that he's saving about 6%. He, he improved the situation about 6%. And the reason I'm using percentages here again is because these absolute numbers are based on an assumed a COP. But the great thing about comparative studies is as long as you assume something and then mm -hmm. make adjustments, you can compare mm -hmm. back to the base that you assumed mm -hmm. and look at a percentage improvement. So mm -hmm. here what we see is about 6%, which means no matter what we assumed for a COP to begin with, we improved it by about 6%. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're looking here at roughly a $30,000 per year savings from uh, the original design through uh, through the iteration process. Yep. So I always like to point out some things to remember about modeling. Uh, this is something that uh, you and I go through quite a bit in our in our training sessions. Mm -hmm. We have made some assumptions here. We've assumed that the racks are perfect, that there's no leakage around the inner rails, that all the gaps are blanked properly, there's no gaps between servers that the leakage, there's no leakage around the ducting that's attached to the cracks. We didn't include conductive heat transfer between the return and supplies. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, as long as you remember these things, the simulations will guide you in the right direction. 
for example, Dana, I think you already are going to be doing insulation, right? So you've already anticipated some of this stuff, and you've, you're going to take, take sensitivity to make sure that it's, that it's there, right? That's I mean, right. There's, there's no substitute for good engineering design. I, I think that's mm -hmm. clear. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can well, just do to here, understand the assumptions, I think that's, that's so important. Just understanding what the assumptions are and how those assumptions, you know, if they were, if they weren't there, what would what would the difference be? Would it be better or worse, and in what way? That's correct. So yeah. Now you can always go back into the model and and, and make some of these uh, additions, add some of these details. Uh, we've been doing some modeling lately with with rack behavior itself. Liz, you were involved in a consulting project recently where we looked at leakage inside the rack. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can begin to do that level of detail if you're concerned about that. Mm -hmm. But um, what this gives us is a good all-around view of the overall situation, and, and now we know where we stand, and if adjustments need to be made, we know where to make them. So, okay, um, I think just in summary, really good design practice here to start off with a simple representation of what it is you're trying to drive for, understand the basic airflow pattern and behavior, and then move towards complexity. Add detail progressively. Um, using things like RTI, RCI, PUE, and cost projections, I like it. I think it helps a lot. I think we're headed towards optimization, Liz, with respect to this kind of thing. And I'd like to see a point in the future where we could set the software up and let it iterate until these things reach a, a, you know, an optimal point. Mm -hmm. Not out of the realm of reason. We've seen that before in CFD and design projects in aerospace and automotive. And, you know, we, we, I think there's a, a way to get there. Mm -hmm. And then optimization at the moment is iterative. Uh, so you make a run, uh, take a look at the outlets, take a look at the, uh, the results, adjust, and then go ahead and run again. And then just make your trade-offs between RTI. Remember, you want to try to get RTI to be 100%, which means reduce your supply air to just what's needed by the racks, and then see if you can get the racks uniform in temp, and then drive your supply air temp up. Always the same sequence. So that's uh, just about uh, 40, 45 minutes. Jen, um, we'll turn it back over to you, and uh, I'll take any questions that you may have seen come in in the meantime. All right. As everyone does like to know, we do have the presentation available for you. We will post a link onto our website if you'd like to view it. But if you do want a copy of the slides, just send us a, a quick email, and we will get a copy of the presentation in PowerPoint format over to you. All right. So, Paul, we've got a few different questions here. Um, one is regarding the supply side controls for cooling. Do you have any comments? regarding that? I, I don't know, Dana, in this particular design, are you going to control temperature using supply side sensors? That's the question. I believe it's being controlled through sensors in the, the aisles. Yeah, that would be the cold aisles, yep. yep. So supply side sensors, yes. So the answer is yes, which is a good best practice. Um, where to sense temperature is important. Uh, there are some who are sensing it on return air, and the problem with return air is there's a, a lag in time between the time the return right. air senses it and the cold air adjusts for it. Um, furthermore, you want really to control the rack inlet temperatures, which means you should be controlling the cold side, not the hot side. Mm -hmm. So right, and we're seeing more and more people positioning their their thermostats on the or you know their their meters on the cold side. That's right of the cracks nowadays. Mm -hmm. All right, how about the impact at 20 kilowatts per cabinet per rack? Um, impact of 20 kilowatts per rack. I, Dana, what was the KW per rack in this model? It varied. Um, I think the max was around 16 mm -hmm. KW. Yeah. In that closer side of the room. So if you wanted to understand what the impact of 20, you could just run it up to 20 and take a look at it. But we didn't, we didn't do that in this case, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. You can okay. see how the higher densities affected the temperatures in the earlier iterations yep. of the models. Yep. Uh, but that's something you can easily look at. 
Mm -hmm. All right. And how about the impact of changing human factor from 80 degrees to 95 degrees? Well, I think human factor has a big play here. Uh, you know, uh, it's important to take into account human factor. There are some who, who tend to, I think, overlook it. Uh, and there are some who are big advocates of cold air contained for purposes of sort of the engineering, right, Liz, the, the, yeah. the pure engineering of it. Uh, but the problem you run into with, with the pure cold aisle contain, if you ask me, is that in the case of pure cold aisle contain, uh, people have to get in and service this environment, and that, there's a human factor issue there, no mm -hmm. question about it. Mm -hmm. I have had designs where people tell me they do cold aisle contain, and then what happens is the, the data center operator will get in there and, and crank the temperature down because mm. they don't realize it's a hot air, hot aisle contained environment or a yeah, cold aisle. Yeah, yeah, right, that they're in the hot aisle. That yeah. they're in the hot aisle, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. So I think human factor is important, and I think it should be considered in the design, and I tend to prefer hot aisle contained for that reason. Now, there are some cases where you simply can't do hot aisle contained because, it, you know, it doesn't lend itself to it. For example, um, a situation, Liz, where it's a naturally convective return room and there's no ceiling plenum at all, and you know, mm -hmm. what choice do you have? Raised floor, and so what choice do you have but to contain yeah. the cold? Yeah, yeah, right, right. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also some options that are coming up these days that are helpful as well, including uh, chimneys or active chimneys. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it would be better, Liz. I think you'd agree if you were to uh, contain the hot and blow it up into the ceiling as far as you could, up into the, you know, and, and then put, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen people put snorkels on top of the crack units and then pull it from up there down, you know, mm -hmm. yep, right? Yep. So the hot air yep. layer oh, yeah. sits at the mm -hmm. top of the room in a sense. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are some new techniques that would allow mm -hmm. someone to modify an existing room and, and, right. and still not use uh, pure cold, cold out contained. But again, you can do it either way. It's just you have to be sensitive to the human factors, I think. Mm -hmm. OK? All right. How about some feedback on the power network cabling locations? Well, I think, Dana, in your design, um, cabling was running up the back of those racks. I, I, I don't know what the design called for for cabling. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, in the case of the CFD modeling, I, I basically assumed it wouldn't affect the airflow mm -hmm. or temperature, mm -hmm. so I didn't bother spending mm -hmm. the time to model it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It does depend on the situation. If, in fact, um, there are no rear doors, um, you know, in, in the design that Dana was showing, uh, mm -hmm. the best way to do that is no rear doors at all. Take them off um, and just use the rear uh, plenum that he put on there, the rear containment, mm -hmm. to let the mm -hmm. air flow. You do need to be sensitive of cabling, of course, because it can restrict the server flow. And this is why, you know, there's been concern about rear door heat exchangers and things like this because the impedance to the flow by the, by the, uh, on the part of the server can, and can be quite high. But if the flow is coming straight down from the ceiling, you know, from the ducts, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the overhead trays run towards the back of the equipment racks, you yeah. know, chances are, Dana, I think Dana made a good judgment to call there yeah. in that the uh, air is not going to be impeded too much by that equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, how about fire codes? Did you deal with fire codes in this case, or did you have an issue with any issues with the fire codes in this case that you know of, Dana? I'll have to plead the fifth on that one, Paul. Yeah. I'm not a fire code guy. Not yet, um. I guess, is the answer, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> because uh, in this case, you are doing hot oil contain. I suppose as long as you've got sensors up in that plenum, that return plenum, you'd have to put some sensors up there. As long as you've got sensors in that return plenum, I think you'd be fine. Cold side shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but um, I, guess, I guess in general, uh, Jen, what, you, what I'd have to say on fire codes is you do have to check. It, they are all sort of local. Um, you know, it is a, a jurisdiction of the local fire marshal, and uh, you should have designs looked at by them to make sure you don't get halfway into something and find out that your local fire marshal won't support it. I know there's right. quite a bit of variance as well across the country, uh, and it gets down to, you know, individual level in terms of uh, accepting or not accepting certain, uh, certain approaches, certain designs. 
All right. Is there an overhead manifold restricting the cold air to the cold aisle? Um, That's the duct work that we yes, are looking at. Yes. Let me just go back and uh, review the design again on the final design. Let me just pop back here, and, and I think that will clear up. Um, so here's the design. And what you have here in the top, so you have this ductwork effectively coming through the uh, the upper manifold, upper sort of deck, and then dropping straight down. You have the hot aisle, the hot air coming up into this section. So this section, effectively, what's going on here is the the cold supply ducts are running through the hot return area and dropping cold air straight down. This is why I made the comment is that we didn't include conductive heat transfer because here we have hot surrounding these ducts, right? If we look straight right. down at the top of this, this whole section right here is hot because it's coming straight up out of those chimneys. Right, right. So but, you know there are you know insulated ducts and that that's may right. be the choice yes. Um, yes. to be made. Yes, in fact, the insulation on these ducts is part of the design uh, criteria, uh, right. right, Dana? So I, I don't think that's a problem. That's right. uh, but uh, to answer the question, yes, uh, the hot air comes straight up here. This is an entire contained level. You can think of it as I've seen this before in supercomputer centers as being an entire floor. Sometimes that they do this in. You know, a whole 10 mm -hmm. foot, uh, 15 mm -hmm. foot floor that they yeah. do something mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, these are the supplies. So, so yeah, that's how that works, Jennifer. All right. Yeah, I was just kind of tough to see if I guess the comment was it was tough to see if it was somewhat contained, but it's but it's all set now. All right. Another question is, what do you think of using stratification and not containment? Stratification. Well, I think that's what I was referring to earlier, Liz, where you mm. would effectively uh, shoot the hot yeah, air I, up into the ceilings I, area I, and then put the mm -hmm. put snorkels on your crack units and reach up there and pull it down. Mm -hmm. um, not bad. I mean, right? It works. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's preferred, but... <laughs> If you don't have, I mean, the, the beauty of the, this that Dana had here was it's a new design. So he has some degrees of freedom that aren't always there. Yeah. But lots of times these new designs are taking place in an old building. Mm -hmm. And so I think you really, you know, an old warehouse, for example, or a retrofitted, you know, building. It was, you had another purpose before. So part of the challenge is just trying to work within the constraints of the building uh, to try and, you know, maximize, you know, the you know, what you can do with the, you know, with clever ideas like this, given mm -hmm. the, the space that you have available to you above and below. So to answer the question, I think stratification, not, not a bad thing, not a preferred thing, but, but yeah, it, it would work. have seen it work. So, okay. All right, next question is, are the hot sides of the rack accessible for IT personnel to make modifications to hardware and cabling with the rear containment? So what did you do about access here, Dana? What were your thoughts here? Are these, do these baffles open or are these containers open or how does that work? Well, the actual design work, yeah. is, is slightly different than how I modeled it. Mm -hmm. um, so those chimneys don't go all the way to the floor. They, right? sit, they sit on top of the racks? That's right. Mm -hmm. They come out the top and sort of angle up and then go straight up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I modeled it like this for simplification purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's essentially doing the same thing yeah. as far as the airflow goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you've used passive racks, passive chimney racks, which in, that means Jennifer, that the access is through the back as it always would. So effectively what he's done is this is no different than a regular uh, convective return, naturally convective return data center, except he has brought the cold air in from the top and is dropping it instead of blowing it up from the bottom, which is a preferred mm -hmm. way. And he has ducted the hot air up out of that cabinet and into the ceiling. And to access it, you go in through the back doors. So these back doors on these racks that he has chosen would be sealed. No perforation at all. All the hot air is going to run straight up out of those, of those chimneys. Yep. Sounds good. All right. 
have any studies been done on the effect observer cable management arms that they have on the airflow rate? Not that I know of. It's, it's a good question because, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to provide impedance. And what we're talking about here, Liz, is that the, you look behind these racks sometimes and there are rats nests, you know, people. Oh, yeah, right. And, you know, it's, it's all specific to whoever did the work and whoever did the installation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some people are neat with cables and they're very careful mm -hmm. and they do a nice job. And then I've seen other situations that are just horrible, you know. <laughs> and I know the flow is being impeded. You can tell just by looking at oh, it that yeah. it's being impeded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I do not know of any studies that have been done to show the impact of it, um, but uh, I have seen some studies done on rack leakage that, that work's being done. A lot of people are focusing on in-rack behavior, airflow behavior in-rack these days. Mm -hmm. Remember, the server was designed to be able to push air straight through into an unimpeded environment. So it's a, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the fans, the people doing electronics packaging, are assuming that that fan has no downside uh, no pressure, no no impedance that beyond the, the fan itself. So when you put cabling back there, you are going to affect the overall flow rate. You're going to affect the delta T on the server and limit its life. But I, I know of, course, of no yeah. specific studies on it. Yeah, and, and of course the the uh, delta Z or whatever you want to call it, the, the depth of the equipment inside the cabinet can vary greatly. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of cabling back there which, you know, may harm the flow, may, you know, may add to the impedance, but then there could be a lot of open space because the equipment uh, just doesn't, it, it's not that deep. So mm -hmm. it, it's all different, you know, every, it's hard to have generalities because of different effects. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, if you run cold air supply through hot air space, don't you get significant condensation issues? I think he's, you're controlling your relative humidity, I would assume. I mean, you, you've got your relative humidity mm -hmm. set, uh, correct, on, on those crack units, Jana. And I think the only issue, and you're also insulating your cold. Mm -hmm. So I don't think humidity is a big deal here. Um, it, there was mm -hmm. a lot of concern about humidity in the, in the you know, 90s, where people thought they had to have a certain amount of humidity in order to keep electrical shock from being an issue on these machines. But... That has declined. So I think as long as you run your relative humidity down low enough, you know, 50, 55 percent, you're going to be mm -hmm. fine with respect to condensation. Mm -hmm. You're not going to hit a dew point mm -hmm. here anywhere. By the way, he's running his supply temps up. So that, that's, that is even better with respect to dew point. So I don't think condensation is going to be an issue. He's not running cold enough to, be, to have condensation be an issue here, Liz, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Well, there's still a delta T, and I guess it really does depend upon the... You know, even everything is floating low or floating high, depending upon where the supply temperature is. So, right. Uh, but as you drive, su but as you drive supply temp up, your yeah. dew point. You know, you get away from your dew point. Uh, right. Your relative humidity can float up. So if you're at right. yeah. 50, 55 percent relative humidity and you're running at a supply air temp of 70 degrees, you, there's no yeah. dew point. You don't have to worry about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Okay. All right. All right. What are you using for air distribution at the ceiling? Can you scale air volume into the cold aisle? Scale it? Oh, you mean set different different flow rates at different diffusers? I think here, Dana, you didn't. You don't have any uh, control over the the. You don't have individual diffusers. Uh, adjustments that are at the bottom of these of the, of these supply ducts, probably, correct? You just drop them straight down. We do actually have diffusers mm -hmm. uh, at the ceiling mm -hmm. to supply the air. So they could be handset, right? They could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is your goal to try and have them uniform? It probably is, right? Yeah, that's sort of what you try to get through the Manually, manually adjust louvers and yeah, yeah. dampers and, yeah. yeah. Certainly the way he's designed the duct work here is to get uniform distribution across them and you could mm -hmm. you could with manual of course, you know, it's it's a it's a VFD. He's using a variable speed drive to drive it. So uh, <laughs> again, these things become control systems. So trying to manually set the dampers on each one of those to get them uniform won't be the same as you walk up and down the the uh, the RPM curve of those of those devices. 
So there is there is a little bit of you know how fine can you tune these things and mm -hmm. still have it uh, behave itself correctly. But uh, mm -hmm. I guess the answer, Jen, in this case is yes. There is a way to do that, and it's done manually through dampeners on the end of each one of those uh, supply uh, uh, ducts. All right, another question. The model assumes blanking panels are in place in all racks. Can the modeling accommodate lack of these panels? In general, yes. Uh, in version 3.2, which is uh, the, the previous version to 4, uh, we, we support uh, rack level modeling, where you can put blanking panels in or out, leave gaps, and, and run it that way. That feature isn't in the first release of 4, uh, which is out now, but will be in a subsequent release. So uh, the, the, the general answer to the question is yes, but specifically it's not in 4. You'd have to use 3.2 to model that, which you can do and is still available and still works fine. Uh, and you can read those models into 4. So one of the things you could do if you wanted to do that is to build them in 3.2, read them into 4, and run them there. So the general answer is yes. The specific detail is we haven't quite got it into 4 yet, but uh, that is next on our list. All right, another question. How are they controlling the VFD on the fans? In raised floor, it's delta P between under floor plenum and room. What are, the, what are you guys doing in this model? I think he's probably using temperature, Dana. Are you using temperature probably? Yeah, I mean, I'd have to go back to the sequence because I wasn't mm -hmm. the engineer, um, mm -hmm. but I believe it is temperature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, temperature, Jan, is the best way to do it. I mean, a lot of people use pressure. A lot of people use delta P. I'm not a big pressure fan, though. I like temperature because the rack is defined. It's the, the rack itself yeah, is the, interested in temperature. It's the ultimate goal. That's right. Yeah. yeah, we want our rack inlets to be a certain temperature. Now, they are related, of course. Um, so, you know, a lot of people use pressure. They want a uniform pressure under the floor. But... Getting a uniform pressure under the floor of a raised floor data center is problematic. And the other problem with pressure is somebody lifts a floor tile off the floor to do something, the pressure changes, the valve changes, everything changes. So uh, temperature is a better, I think, a better method. And uh, the question becomes, where do you measure any of these things? Uh, position, location of sensors is always a touchy issue in, in any kind of control system, <laughs> feedback-driven control system. But in this case, it, 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 temperature would be the way to go. All right, that's it for questions. We did have a comment that um, from what this gentleman had seen in his environment, even the most neatly installed cable management arms anecdotally seem to drive the air upward rather than back. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and I've seen that too. And that's why, you know, chimneys aren't a bad thing. They come off the back and straight up to the top because it's all going to drift up anyway. Um, but I think we're going to see more sensitivity about cabling. And uh, remember that the delta T's on these things are going up. We're seeing now a lot of 30 degree delta T's being used mm -hmm. across servers. Mm -hmm. We're seeing server temperatures and specifications going up. ASHRAE has just released new specifications saying now that server in that temperatures can get up well above 80 degrees, up to 90 degrees. These things are getting hot. Mm. And uh, I think we're going to see more sensitivity about how uh, cabling is done and what is done about it on the back. I, I am familiar with the arms that he's talking about. And, you know, you, 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 there's a lot more sensitivity, a lot more care that needs to be done. So, yeah. All right. If that's it, then uh, we'll close it out for now. And, uh, Unless there's, so, unless there's any more questions that have come in? Oh, we, did, we Actually, we do have one more. This model was 6,000 square feet. About how long did the entire process take? Good one for you, Dana. I mean, how long did it take you to, to, to build and, and go through your sequencing on this model? Well, I think it's, it's different for every modeler. But what I do, like I said, I, I do it in iterations. So I run simulations as I go. Mm -hmm. and I think to get to the the final um, from the the initial model, I think it was a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I came back and reran this model with uh, the chimneys, I think that was that was probably another day of my time. I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. Now, um, 
that sounds about normal, I think, uh, your experience, uh, Liz, is that I think feel so, right? Yeah. I mean, he can take take advantage of tools like copying, so making one, you know, making, say, the, the, the uh, ductwork behind the racks, um, making it once, and then just picking it up and copying it to other locations. That can save a lot of time. So, but sometimes, you know, the, I find that the, the bulk of the work is going from the drawings and, you know, making sure you have all the information on the drawings, you know, and it's that step. It's not so much the mechanics of, of building it as it is going back and forth between the drawings and making sure that you, you've got it, you've got it right. You understand it properly. So and that's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. It seems, but it, it seems is good to build it in stages because you know that's really, you know, uh, you know, so so often people build something so complicated right from the start and you know they uh, get lost in the sauce as it were. So yeah, it's yeah. better. Dana did did it just right with doing it in stages. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing. Yeah, go ahead, boss. Well, the other thing here is a lot of symmetry in the data center, so you get to take advantage of symmetry. I think is right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know the, another thing too, it's good for your sanity if you do it in stages. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. if you have a really complex data center, mm -hmm. you try to dive into it and build the whole thing all at once, it could be a little daunting. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. easy to lose the, uh, the the forest for the trees, so to speak. You know, you you are into so much detail that you. I mean, even from a post-processing point of view, Liz, if if there's if we see too much detail in a model, it's very difficult to figure out what the big parameters are, right? You're over yeah. overloaded with data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think in any model, any kind of modeling you do, it's important to focus on the key parameters. What are the most sensitive parameters that drive the design? And um, therefore, starting off with the ones you think are the most <laughs> yeah, dominant. which may not be the ones that <laughs> That's are true. Yeah, That's you, true. You learn as you go. You learn as you go. But starting simple and working your way up is more revealing, I think, mm -hmm. uh, than to start complex and then try to decipher which one is most important. Mm -hmm. So that's that's our experience. Well, okay, unless there's any other questions, Jen, I'll let you wrap it up. Sure. Yep, that is all. So on behalf of Paul, Liz, and Dana, and myself, Thanks again for attending our webinar today. On a separate note, Paul and I are going to be attending the Data Center World at Com show next week in Nashville. So if any of you that are still remaining on the line are going to be heading to Nashville, we'll be in booth number 421 during the expo. And we're also hosting a product information session on the Tuesday, October 2nd at 9.15 in the morning in Jackson, AB. So if you can... Come and see us. We'll uh, be showcasing Coulson version 4, and we'd love to see you in person. And again, we hope to have you online with us at our next webinar. Thanks, everyone, and have a great day.